Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. The title of the sermon today is Christmas in almost July. The scripture I just read to you all is, as I am certain, familiar to you as a part of the Christmas story that we hear each year. The wise men are most likely Zoroastrian priests whose ancestors had learned this prophecy from the Jewish people while the Jews were in exile in Babylon. The prophecy of the coming Messiah, Emmanuel, God is with us. These men had seen signs that told them, them that it was time for them to go searching, searching for the baby Jesus. This sermon's subtitle could be Searching for Jesus. The wise men knew that there would be a Messiah, a Savior, the true King, coming into this world. They knew that when he arrived into their lives, nothing would be the same. They knew that he had been promised by the ancient teachings of the Jewish people, and the Jewish people believed that God always kept his promises. Thus, these Zoroastrian priests had traveled so far to find this Jesus, the Messiah. They were literally on a journey to Jesus. Oftentimes we talk about our lives as being a journey. We all are literally time travelers. We travel through these lives moving ever forward, moving ever closer to decline and ultimately our demise. And we often ask ourselves or each other, what is the purpose of this life? What am I searching for? Why am I here? In general, we're all, we are all searching for a meaning to this life. Sometimes we become flippant and chalk it up to it all being about a good time. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. It's too often in the back of our mind. But in spite of these feudalistic, this feudalistic attitude, I think many of us, well, most of us, I'd like to think all of us, are really genuinely pondering, what is the meaning of my life? What is it all about? Even where do we go from here? What am I searching for? Even during the period of my life when I called myself an atheist, I was still wondering why, and I was still searching. I didn't know what I was searching for, but I knew that there was more to this world. There had to be more to this world. Eventually, I found it again. I say again because like many, I had wandered away from the church as a youth. I dropped out of confirmation class because I didn't like the minister's answers to some of my questions. I let the limits of a man put limits on God. That's not really how it's supposed to be. We are all limited. God is not. The thing about God is he's always there. Even when we turn our backs on him, he's always there, waiting and watching, observing our searching, and hoping we'll eventually turn around and come back home. Our second reading today was the parable of the prodigal son. Now the folks from Woodlawn know all too well that this is my favorite parable. <coughs> Please allow me this morning to go through it with you and maybe explain to the rest of you why I firmly believe that this parable is the most important of all the parables, at least in helping us to understand the nature of God and ultimately what we're all searching for, the gift that we've been given that Christmas so long ago. Let's hear again the teaching of Jesus in the parable of the prodigal son. Luke 15, 11, 24. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that falls to me. And he divided his living between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took his journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in loose living. And when he had spent everything, a great famine arose in that country, and he began to be in want. So he went and joined himself to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have fed on the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. 
And he arose and came to his father. But while he was yet at a distance, his father saw him and had compassion, and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and make merry. For this son was this, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to make merry. Obviously, the first thing that we have going on here is the younger son's complete lack of respect or regard for his father. His statement to his father on wanting his inheritance immediately is basically saying to the father, your wealth is more important to me than you are. I wish you were dead so I could have the money that is entitled to me. This incredible request is callous, to say the very least. The next thing, which is equally amazing, is that the father acquiesces to his younger son's unreasonable demand. The father gives the son his share of the father's property, which under Jewish tradition would have been a third of all that the father possessed. Under Jewish custom, the eldest son would be entitled to a double portion, in other words, two-thirds of the father's estate. Given this property, the younger son liquidates the assets and takes off to parts unknown with the cash in hand. To add injury to insult, the younger man goes off to a foreign land, Gentile territory, and proceeds to waste his inheritance on wine, women, and song. And to make it even all the worse, that's Gentile wine, Gentile women, and Gentile song. He's not even blowing his money on naughty Jewish girls. These are Gentile strumpets he's carousing. In short order, he's blown through the cash and he finds himself in the worst possible situation that a good Jewish boy can find himself in. He's tending to swine. At last, the boy comes to his senses, a little late as everyone notes, and realizes that he needs to go back home. Back home, perhaps, his kind father will allow him to live in the household as a servant or a slave. Ashamed and humbled, he turns his face towards his father's home. The boy nears his old home and is barely upon the horizon when his father spies him on the road. Immediately, the father forgets all decorum and runs to the boy. He throws his arm around the son and kisses him in sheer joy. The son tries to offer up his plea of being a servant to the father, but the father simply ignores this suggestion. The father isn't interested in his son being a servant to him. He has other ideas. Bear in mind during all of this that the son has been off in Gentile territory carrying on with Gentile women, and whereas the scripture doesn't indicate that the father knew that the son had been tending to hogs, we the readers, as well as the listeners, in Jesus' day know. And we are horrified, for the son is about as ritually unclean as one can be. Being rural people, we realize fully well that the father would have known about the hogs long before he was close enough to embrace his son. There would have been, as we say, a certain aura about the young son. But the father disregards all this uncleanliness and the smell and freely and spontaneously embraces his lost son. Frankly, he doesn't care what the son has been up to. His son has returned to him. The son has come in search of him. That's all the father cares about. The father quickly turns and calls to a servant who no doubt has come running when he saw his master running, which is something that no adult Jewish male ever did. And this bears no small amount of notice. The father calls for the servant to fetch immediately three items. Now we need to carefully examine these three items because they are very important to the understanding of this extremely vital parable. The first item that the father calls for is a robe. We'll skip over the second item for just a moment, but the third item that the father requests are a pair of shoes. Both of these items signify that the boy is not a slave nor a servant. The robe isn't to keep him warm, rather it's a sign of his station. And remember, it's the best robe. The shoes are important for only slaves, are barefoot. But now let's look at the second item, for this is the crucial and all-important item that the father calls for immediately upon embracing his son. Let's pause and recall that often in scripture, excuse me, often in scripture, the second Excuse me, in scripture and ancient writing, it is what's in the center that is what is most important. The second item is the ring. Now this isn't just a ring, this would be a signet ring. 
A signet ring shows that the boy is a part of the family. It shows that this boy is the father's son, just as he was when he left his father's family behind. The father has restored his son to his place in the family. Once he was dead to them, but now he lives again. The father has restored his son. He has reconciled the son to those whom he has injured through his careless behavior, through his sins. The son could not restore himself. It was only through the power and the grace of the father that he is reconciled. The father so loved the son. Above all else, in my opinion, this parable is a story of reconciliation, a complete restoration of what which has been broken and distanced by sin. The Father, representing, of course, our Holy Father in heaven, through his station as the Father, and because of his unlimited love and grace, has forgiven the boy so completely that it is as if none of the transgressions had ever occurred. Such is the amazing depth and breadth of our Holy Father's love for each of us. This love goes far, far beyond forgiveness and grace. One can forgive and love without wanting to be reconciled, without wanting to be restored to those that they love. Our Heavenly Father's deepest longing and greatest attribute is this unfailing desire to be restored, restored and reconciled with each and every single one of His children. No matter how lost or how sinful or how unclean we might be, we will, He will run to us and embrace us and place upon our finger the ring that identifies to all who see that we are His and His alone. The other part of this story, the part that is pertinent to our message today, is that the young man in the story was searching for something. He was just grossly mistaken as to what he was searching for, which is a lot like most of us today. Just like us, the son didn't realize that what he was searching for, the gift of the Christmas story in Matthew's reading, the thing the world is searching for, has been and always will be right there waiting for us to return. The gift that the world is so desperately in need of came to us on that Christmas morning nearly 2,000 years ago. But that gift can come to you right now, here, today. It can truly be Christmas in July. Well, almost July. For as I said, the Father in the story is our Lord and our God. He waits even though we've deserted him. We've turned our backs and walked away, embracing the distractions and decadence of the world. He waits and waits for us to realize that what we've been searching for was what we had in the beginning and left behind. That is the love of an all-powerful and all-loving God. If you haven't already, it's time to turn and head home. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for this day. We thank you for the beautiful weather that you blessed us with this morning. And Lord, we ask that you might forgive us when we stray away, Lord. And please, call even the louder for us. Come back to you. We pray this in your loving glory. Amen.